Hi, I'm Greg Levine. I'm managing editor of Fire Dog Lake, and this is the party line for April 1st, 2011. And it seems like only yesterday that the president was on television telling of us of his rationale for uh, waging war in Libya. I'm sorry, of waging time limited scope-limited kinetic military engagement in Libya. Uh, it seems like only yesterday, but actually it was Monday, which was actually 10 days after we started getting all kinetically engaged, which itself was about 31 days, according to the president, after he started consulting with foreign leaders about getting all kinetically engaged in Libya. So it was 41 days after they started discussing it that the president came on television to tell us about his scope-limited plans, uh, except that that's not the worst of it because apparently he didn't really tell us about his plans because a couple of weeks before that speech he signed an executive order that authorized the CIA to get a whole lot less time and scope limited and a whole lot more kinetically and militarily engaged by perhaps arming the rebels and training the rebels on how to use those armaments and also looking around for indigenous leaders of this revolution that we can then either uh, identify, single out, or install to lead the new uh, Libyan government. And while the object, according to the president, is not regime change, the object is clearly to put somebody else in charge of Libya. I leave that one for you to debate. Uh, all very disturbing, but perhaps even more disturbing than all of that is that it seems like there's absolutely no institutional memory here. I mean, there's no one in the administration, honestly, that doesn't remember what happened in Afghanistan when we armed the Mujahideen. There's honestly nobody in, in the administration that has read a book even, doesn't even have to remember, has read a book even, about, about what happened uh, that the, in, in Vietnam, how we escalated the war and our involvement in Vietnam. I mean, is there anybody there maybe who even just saw an episode of Behind the Music? Or at least saw the whole episode. I mean, I get the sense that, like, they saw the first part, where it's just like, oh, we're just a bunch of kids, and we really, really love the music. And then next thing we know, it's like everyone's playing Funky Town, and everywhere we go, it's Funky Town, Funky Town, Funky Town. But then there's a commercial break, you see? And what happens after the commercial break, which I feel like nobody in the administration stuck around to see, is when they come back and say, and then there were the drugs. And inevitably, honestly, there were the drugs, or the guns, or the bombs, or the terrorist blowback. That's part of this story. That's behind the kinetics, if you will. Uh, and it's upsetting. It's upsetting not just in this singular context, but it's upsetting in a, in a broader way, because it seems like ever since Operation Eagle Claw, which was... Jimmy Carter's chest-thumping attempt to militarily rescue the hostages uh, in Iran that it failed so horribly and was aborted in the desert with the loss of eight American lives. Ever since then, Democrats have been looking for something to prove that, you know, they really can do this. They really can exercise military might, uh, push a button, send troops into harm's way, kick a little global ass. It's like Democrats are searching for a good war to tie their name to. And um, what's really sad here is that there's really no such thing as a good war. I mean, for the Obama administration, I think they thought that Afghanistan was going to be their good war. Uh, the president actually campaigned on it. It's one of the few campaign pledges he kept. He said he was going to escalate the war in Afghanistan. He escalated the war in Afghanistan, the idea being that we were going to do it right, that the, the previous administration had turned their attention away for some foolhardy mission in Iraq. But honestly, we were going to set up uh, where there once was a, uh, a theocracy, a dictatorial, horrible, terrorist harboring theocracy in a backward country, we were going to set up this beautiful, flowering democracy there, and all it would take was a few more, shall we say, boots on the ground for some time-limited amount of time. Uh, but of course, as we know, that has not gone good or well. And so the administration... I think seeing an opportunity in what a lot of people are starting to call the Arab Spring has turned its eyes to Libya and another attempt to find a good outcome 
that might perhaps inoculate them from attacks that will likely come up in the 2012 election about how they have managed uh, the wars, which, like it or not, the Obama administration now owns uh, in Afghanistan, if not Pakistan, and perhaps maybe Somalia, Yemen, and of, oh, Iraq, remember Iraq, still there. Um, and the sad thing, I keep saying sad, but it's sad, is that it won't inoculate them because the attacks will still come, but it also is not going to come out good or well because war isn't good. It never is. It might sometimes be necessary, probably a lot fewer times than you think, but it might sometimes be necessary, but even then, it's not a good war. Because when you militarize an option, the outcome is inherently messy. Not just because of all of the dead people, and all of the destruction, and all of the displaced people, and all of the cleaning up, and all of the cleaning up you never get to. Not just because of all that, but because of the power structures you set in motion when you decide to take on a problem with a military solution. In fact, it, it just, it, frankly, it almost, it almost never works. I mean, what, what does work, what works are organic popular uprisings. And, and believe it or not, organic popular uprisings uh, and negotiated settlements tend to breed much more stable situations than military solutions. Maybe that's not so counterintuitive, not to me anyway, but apparently to a lot of people it is. Because when you, when you militarize a situation, you, you do a couple of things. First off, you, you actually empower the military parts of a revolution, right? You need to turn to them. They're your fighting forces. They need to be in authority. They're the people you coordinate with. They're the people who you install as the heads. And so then, when and if this revolution succeeds, those are the people who have the natural power base. Those are the people you, as a government, a foreign government, have a relationship with. Those are the people who wind up taking control. This happens both in, in leftist and rightist revolutions. So, so rather than the, the thinkers and the politicians and the diplomats, you get the generals running the system. And, and, and that's bad, but, but also bad is that you get an inherently unstable system because people who come to power by force have to stay in power, most likely, by force. It is a literal live by the sword, die by the sword. And, and the thing is that the force that needs to be used because our timetables uh, may not match their timetables, often has to be backed up with United States aid, and that means military aid, and uh, covert operations, perhaps, and uh, lots of us backing the wrong guy and repressing their people to make sure that the revolution that we worked so hard for, uh, quote, succeeds. Is that, is that good? I mean, there, there aren't a lot of good choices here, I admit that. And, and it may very well be that in the short run, uh, Obama's involvement in Libya has prevented a, a wholesale slaughter in parts of that country. But in the long run, not just are there lots of countries where the very same situation presents itself, in the long run, what are we going to wind up with in Libya? Are we going to identify say, a disaffected general from the Libyan regime to um, put in, in place of Gaddafi? You know, maybe, maybe they're right. Maybe it really isn't regime change after all, um, which is, again, really sad, uh, not good, and alas, for so many of these involvements, the party line. I'll see you next week.